<laughs> Let's get started, shall I? Um, so, like Ben said, uh, we are talking about video theory, but before we do that, I want to ask all of you, what makes a video interesting to watch, in your opinion? And the reason I put down here, hint, what did you do today, is because when you're making a video, you don't want to just drone and tell every little detail, right? Do you, like, if I asked, you know, Jeff, what did you do today, in a nutshell, what did you do? Um, I ran errands. <laughs> there you go, right? You didn't <coughs> have to explain the super little detail or tell me at 8 a.m. I was here, 9 a.m. I was here, 10 a.m. I was here. You just wrapped it all up in a nice little package. I ran errands, right? <laughs> Storytelling. That's what this is all about, right? Humans, we're storytellers. We tend to do that. Video production, it's just another way to do that very thing. So that's what I want to impress upon you is this idea that when you're building a video, it's trying to entertain somebody with a story or, or convey to them something that they'll find interesting to watch. Right? So we're going to talk a lot about how to tell a visual story. And Ben, you can jump in whenever you want. So I'm going to dominate this. We're going to start off, though, by watching a, a video ironically, on YouTube um, because this guy really does get it. And this will introduce us to the ideas that we're going to keep expanding on today. So, let me load this. Storytelling. I mean, every time we make a video, aren't we just telling the story? And just as a written story is made of words and sentences and paragraphs, compelling video stories are also made up of smaller pieces. Hmm, I know there's a key here somewhere. Oh, there it is. Individual shots strung together to tell a story. Learning how to shoot a video sequence, well, it can go a long way to turn your video story from dreadful to delightful. Sequencing is the foundation of video storytelling. You do it by compressing time. Without this compression, what you're left with are long, boring video clips. Proper sequencing gives a video editor a better way to tell the story by using a combination of wide, tight, and medium shots. By creating a sequence like this, you can efficiently propel your audience through your story. Sequencing helps you to compress time by compressing action. If you videotape the process of somebody scrambling an egg, it takes too long to show it as one continuous shot. You would show them entering the kitchen, opening the fridge, getting out an egg, finding a pan, well, you get the idea. Here, I've sped up the process because it took over three minutes in real time. But you don't have that kind of time. If your video is boring, your viewer's gone. You have about four seconds before they decide whether they're gonna stay or go. So sequencing helps you tell your story. Let's revisit our egg scene. We go from wide to a string of close-ups. Each shot gives the viewer an important detail about the story. We move quickly through the process, a string of peak moments, right down to the sizzle of the butter in the pan. To shoot this right requires some thought before you even begin to fire up your camera. You might want to make a list of all the shots you think you're going to need. But you know what? Edit it together. You can take this real-time three-minute clip and cut it down to 20 seconds or less. The cool thing is, your audience understands this sequence of shots and accepts this compression of time. Why is that? Well, it's because we see it all the time in television and in movies. Mmm, good eggs. Shooting a sequence on the fly requires a little practice and a lot of anticipation. When shooting a sequence, think about how you're going to put your shot together. What's your establishing shot? What's your detail shot? What story are you trying to tell? This means asking yourself, where's the action headed? Where do I need to stand to be in the right spot? What shots get me from point A to point B? Okay, if you're looking for a list of do's and don'ts, here you go. Shoot a wide variety of shots. If you have the time, shoot a wide, a medium, and a tight version of every shot. Tight shots can appear back to back, but adjacent wide shots, well, they're a jump cut, and they confuse the audience. Shoot an action, and then the reaction, or the cause and the effect. You're showing the viewer what's important to your story, so make certain those points are clear. Shoot three tight or medium shots for every one wide shot. 
Frankly, there are very few trombonists who make excellent videographers. Using your zoom just makes you look like an amateur. Hold your shots at least six seconds. 10 is better. You can shorten it in editing. If you're following something that moves, let it motivate how you move the camera. If you're panning over to a building, follow a car in the foreground over to your destination. Sequencing will take your story to the next level. It does take a little practice, but with that practice, your audience will thank you. If nothing else, they're more likely to stick around to the end. Right. So, yeah, he is that, I mean, in a nutshell, we can share this with you, but he summarizes pretty much all the ideas that you would need to at least take your video from that one long clip to making a story out of it. And that's kind of the goal, right? That's what sequencing is. And so that's what we're talking about tonight. So shooting and editing, they're the essential components of sequencing. Sequencing is the art of storytelling. It's the combination of shots, right? Like he mentioned, for every wide shot, you get three medium to close-up shots, right? So when you're editing, you can cut between them. Right? So what's a sequence? Well, right, we just told that. We're gonna give you an example here, a baseball play. So some of you, I don't know, anybody a baseball fan in here, watch baseball or sports in general, right? So let's follow this thought process. We set up a wide shot, right, to establish where we're at, what mm. field we're playing at. Now we cut to the pitcher. He's getting ready to be, you know, the hero. He's going to strike this guy out. He throws. That's the next shot. We see the ball coming from behind the batter. He's going to swing at it. Then what happens? We go back to a wide to see where the ball's going. And then, if you're paying really close attention, you get that last shot of whichever player is closest, the director in a booth somewhere will say, all right, we're, we got that shot, we're going to you. And it cuts to that guy trying to catch the ball. So it's visual storytelling, right? This, this is a story that just visually makes sense. You wouldn't need announcers to tell you what happened. You can see it. Okay? So I want you to think about this, and this is more of a group activity. If we were covering a speaker's presentation, for instance, I know it's not the most exciting thing in the world, but how could you sequence this together? Does anybody have any ideas as far as how you would start off? What, what would your first shot be? Wide. Perfect, Frank. Wide. Why are we, why are we doing a wide shot? To, to give it the context. Exactly. Right? To and give us context. Establishing shot. Establishing, right? We, now we know. Well, we're in this auditorium. So we better go wide. What's the next shot you'd probably want to do? Whatever it is, <clears throat> the event that's going on there. Sure. Yeah, is you there anything? This has got to be uh, so much, well, if it's a game, not that game, but say it was something else with children playing. You know, you're going to see the children, so that would be the next step to show who's going to be in this. Is right. That logical? Right, Lisa. So uh, the speaker, right? I would probably go wide shot mm -hmm. to the speaker. Mm -hmm. And if they're talking about something, like we're doing right now, somebody's talking, maybe the camera's on me for a medium, right? But if it's children, it would be the right. group of children. Well, and, if, I, and if, if we're doing this conversation back and forth, the beauty of it is that this camera would cut back to you responding to what I'm saying or giving your reactions, whether you're bored or you're like excited and interested, right? So that's, that's another part of this. Ben, is there anything you want to add about that or not necessarily I mean if they it depends on the type of presentation but if they have any type of like materials or something or maybe they're presenting how to make something out of paper or whatever you cut to like a you know close-up shot to the you know the materials they've got on their table or whatever whatever it is you're going to use exactly yeah. so what you're saying basically to us you can have your beginning which is showing you the big picture of whatever it is mm -hmm. and then what the person or persons is going to be the main object next and then what they're going to do and how they do it. You got your beginning, your middle, and your end is what you're saying. Is that correct? In a sense. I In mean, a sense, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you just want to have a variety of different different types of shots from medium, wide to close to be able to, um, you know, tell change story. up your shots, tell your story, and have a, you know, variety of different visuals. See, y'all got me learning something totally new. I don't do this. Yeah, well, I usually just run my mouth. <laughs> well, and, a, and a, lot of, a lot of public access shows don't necessarily follow this because they're yeah. talk shows. A lot of talk shows don't follow that. They might the the things they might cut away to is you know they go from a two shot to a single of whoever's talking, mm -hmm. you know, back to a two shot or maybe to a single of the other person or possibly lay over some B roll if you have some B roll of whatever you're talking about. Um, that's B roll technically you know even though it's 
shot outside of, of the facility, mm -hmm. um, it's still, you know, it's considered a, a um, you know, piece of material that, that helps tell a story. Um, in the case of the speaker, if they also have a PowerPoint presentation, mm -hmm. yep. ask them to send it to, to you so you have it digitally. Yep. And then you can use that as an asset as your, to, f to fill for B-roll to help make his points. Well, the the last if you go to our YouTube channel, um, okay. the last producers club that we did, um, I did I that. Like you, you can see the slides here, but whenever there was any um, slides that had like pictures or something like that, I would cut to a full screen of those slides. Okay. So, it's so like I can learn more about it. Jeff, you had something. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 that's fine. What's all been said? Very good comments. Um, one thing too, I think the more you do it and we're talking about documentary kind of filmmaking, not mm -hmm. a studio show, right. is that uh, the best lead cut is the one that's the most compelling. Mm -hmm. And that may not be a wide shot. It yes. might be a tight shot on a speaker, like yours truly there, <laughs> and saying something very powerful. Yes. And um, you may want to start out that, and you're going to say, who's that? And maybe you have a shot of someone in the audience, like a tears coming down their face oh, right afterwards, yes. and then you show the wide shot. So it all depends. Um, there's no written law that you start wide, go medium, right. and go tight. It's what is the strongest oh, storytelling element um, sequence you can use. Yeah. The subject matter. Yeah. I couldn't have put it better. And, and that's actually another part that I wasn't intending to touch on, but the attention getter. Right? Mm -hmm. All of us have probably gone through the third, fourth grade where you had to write a paper and start with your lead, your body, your end, right? Beginning, middle, end. The attention getter is something like Jeff's talking about where it is uh, an emotional reaction. Yes. It's something very strong, like uh, I just did a piece on domestic abuse. And the opening uh, line I had was this woman talking or re retelling a conversation she'd had with her daughter who didn't know who abused her. And it was, of course, her husband, yes. right? And so I end with this woman asking her, uh, and telling, telling the audience that uh, her daughter had asked her, who was it, daddy? You know, and that's powerful. That's, yes, that's a really strong pull because, oh my gosh, who hurt you? Yeah. Dad, what? So that leads right into the whole story. So yes. it sucks you in. Yes, right? it does. So it's an attention getter. Um, I was going to just say too, um, the, the example of, of um, starting with a wide shot, um, you know, that's, that's just an example. It is what, right. you know, it is what a lot of, a lot of like Hollywood movies and stuff will do. You'll see that mm -hmm. a, a very first shot after the credits is going to be a wide shot of, because it's establishing the scene. It's showing where the, the characters are. Right. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's how you have to do it, but mm -hmm. it's just, they, they call it an, an establishing shot for a reason because it's establishing the location, basically. So, But you're um, at the same time giving us the opportunity to see that there's a beginning, a middle, and an ending. And if you want to tell a story, you've got to begin somewhere. Then your subject matter, and the examples of what your subject matter is doing, all the way to your ending. Right. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah. 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 Okay. okay. Make it sure. So we're going to talk a little bit about the, the element of shot. Creating story options is how I think of shots. All shots are, are a different way to present information or move a story forward, right? So the reason uh, our friend here in the video was talking about taking for every one wide shot three other shots is because then it gives you options in the editing room to cut back and forth between things. Again, uh, if, and I'll give you an example, if something is very emotional, you may want to be close, right? Because it shows a level of intimacy versus having a subject a little further away, which may show some distance. Mm -hmm. um, this also applies in, in just filmmaking as well. Kind of reading the way shots string together. Uh, I don't know, Ben, is there anything you want to add on? Yeah, I, mean, I, I was just going to say it's always better, um, especially in like short film um, or if you're getting like B-roll for a documentary or something like that, to just shoot as many shots as you can. You know, even if you um, you get a sequence of shots, you do the wide, medium, and close up on a on a you know something that somebody's doing, and you don't use any of those shots at all when you go to edit it. That's fine. At least you have it. 
it's there to use it you know it's better than than all you just have this long space with no you know b-roll to cover it or whatever um another form of backup it's yeah it's just it's Make better sure to have to, more options than happen. less yes yeah. options I understand I'm learning. Y'all gonna have me making films, huh? <laughs> no. <laughs> Absolutely. Why not? All right. So, again, shots are those raw puzzle pieces of a visual story. It's not something that's been tweaked at all. It's just what you've collected in the field or, you know, wherever you're shooting at, right? So, we're going to take a look really quick at some of the most common compositions. Again, he had mentioned a few of them, but let's slow down a little so we can analyze them. So the wide shot, and I love Star Wars and I love football, so that's why I chose those examples. Sorry, you guys don't like them. Um, but uh, as we mentioned, it establishes a scene and it orients the viewer. It gives them an idea of where the heck they are, what's going on, uh, where the characters are in relation to other characters, that sort of thing, right? And generally, the setting, where you're at, takes up the majority of your frame, of your screen. So if you look at like Hoth here, yeah, I know. Is this ATAT? Right. <laughs> is right in the middle, but you can see Luke dangling right there. So it gives you a sense of, holy smokes, he's this little guy on this big robot. Well, it's not, whatever you want to call it, transport. Anyway, it just gives you an idea of, wow, this is crazy. And then it goes to close ups, if you've seen the movie. Um, it's often used during sports events and scenery and cityscapes, especially. And yeah, it's almost common. Ben, you want to take me? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Um, so then the medium shots are going to show um, the, the actions or interactions between multiple characters. So um, like it, Dietrich was saying, you start with that wide shot of Luke dangling from the ATAT, -AT, and then you're going to cut to a closer shot of what he's doing to you know, try to get down from there. Um, and then um, the subject and setting take up equal areas of the frame, so um, you're not too tight yet, but you're not wide where your, your characters look small within the frame. Um, you can see, you know, you can still see where they are pretty well, and but you want to see the details of what exactly they're doing also. Um, and these are often used in interviews and action scenes. So like uh, Saving Pride Ryan there, you got that nice, that, that probably started with a wide shot of all the boats coming up to the beach and then they cut to this medium shot of all the guys in the boat there. Exactly. That's an awesome movie, by the way, for sequences, if you want to. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> ding, ding. It's a good one. <laughs> All right, so now we're on close-ups. So close-ups are the shot that you can almost overuse no matter what, I'd say, because it doesn't look awkward when you go from a close-up to a close-up to a close-up, unlike the other shots. The wide shot, you almost never want to do that transition because, again, that the purpose of that shot is to establish a scene. So if you're jumping from establishing one scene to another without something in between there, it looks really awkward. Mm -hmm. And I should have probably put an example, so I apologize for that. Right, but the close-up, it shows details, emotions, or specific actions. And a great example of this is actually with Dunkirk. If you guys haven't seen that movie, I highly recommend it. Um, the reason being is the facial expression of the actors tells you everything you need to know. Mm -hmm. Same with Jack Nicholson's character or Will Smith. I mean, you can kind of get a sense of where their mind is at, how they're feeling, mm -hmm. um, what the, you know, what's going on in, in their being at that point. So the subject obviously takes up a majority of your composition right, when you're framing it. And it's often used during emotions, uh, emotional scenes, right, like we talked about or action reaction. That's a big one. So if you if you watch a sequence with uh, like The Shining for instance, you'll get a close up of his face mm -hmm. and then a close up of the wife screaming, mm -hmm. right? Because she's like, "Ah, he's going to kill me." Ah, I got to go. Yep. So, yeah. So, from before, this is an example of a sequence we talked a little bit, but let's give it terms. A wide shot establishing the close up of the ball and a medium shot of the guy actually throwing it. Mm -hmm. So you see the action, right? Sometimes you can get away with actions with close-up shots, but it's uh, trickier to keep the camera on, you know, whatever you're, you're looking at because you're so close. So, yeah. anyway. Um, these are some tips. So, shoot to edit. This is a term I've heard since I started doing video production. Essentially what it means is, while you're shooting your video, think about how you're going to edit it in 
post, right? When you get back to your computer or wherever, did you shoot it in a way that you could pull shots and mix them together and make a sequence? And what it does is it saves you from wasting your time um, on shots that you'll never use. But like Ben said, it depends on what type of shooting you're doing. Yeah. How much time you have. And how much time you have. Really, it boils down to that. But if you keep that rule in mind, each shot you get will serve a purpose in your story. And so, like Ben was saying, if you, if you prepare enough and you understand what your subject is and, and the message you're trying to create, you should be able to figure out what shots you'll need. Um, Lisa, I'll give you an example like with your show. So if, I'm, if you're discussing, uh, let's learn to get along, getting along with people, you would probably want shots of people getting along, right? So where do people get along often? I'm gonna throw it out there. School. Restaurants, uh, uh, faith places, right? Church. Church, yeah, church. You know, you would go there, maybe get B-roll of them. And, and talk about that event and the impact it has on people getting along, you know, that sort of thing. And you use that B-roll to cover what you're talking about. But it would make your show a little more, you know, engaging, a little more interesting right. rather See, than... See, y'all teach me, I don't know about no B and no rolls and the hoes either. <laughs> well, and I, don't, I knew nothing of this. Some of your shows that, that you've done, like the music ones, you know, mm -hmm. we've done sequencing in those before. When you, when you have musicians on, you get right. a close-up of them playing the guitar. Right. Yeah. And you do so a close-up of them singing. See, that's that's sequencing. It. But some of your other guests, um, like uh, uh, Anne... Um, she's a writer. Right. If she ever does any book signing events, go there with a the camera and get shots of her signing oh. books for people, and then you can overlay that over the interview, and it just gives it, uh, you know, more. a little bit more variety. Yeah, yeah and, and with that note, you could get video of her at her home actually writing, writing. actually yeah. sitting at a computer See, writing. Have me learn how to work these yeah. cameras now. <laughs> Again, this is the beauty of it. That's why <laughs> you know certain videos are very engaging, is because if if you look at a, a lot of highly produced or you know professional level videos they don't tend to stay on shots more than three to four seconds because you're always cutting around to show a different angle of something right. or just just mix it up so the viewer gets uh, more of a taste for what the subject is. Variety. Right? Yeah, I have a variety. question. Yes sir. Right. B-roll. Yes. It's a it's a term I'm not ah. as familiar with as I'd like to be. <laughs> That's what I'm saying I'm going uh, to do. Do you want to taste this one or you Go sure. For it. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Go so there's so there's a roll and there's b roll. In the in the essence of, of an interview, for instance, um, the a roll is your interview. So um, you're you know you've got your your different shots, your close ups of your your subjects, your um, wide shots of of you know everybody who's up on, on stage or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then your b roll is basically a, accompanying footage that you can overlay over that interview. So let's say, you know, you're interviewing a firefighter. You might want to go out and get some shots of them actually at a fire, and then you can overlay that footage. Um, add it to it. You know, mm -hmm. Add it uh, on top of the, the interview. So mm -hmm. you don't cut out, you know, the audio. You keep the audio going of what they're saying, and you just you lay this, this video it's like on a, top. Like on, on the news, they're, they're mm -hmm. talking and showing us, and then they put in stuff. They're, okay, I'm catching yeah. But yeah. as you're shooting, are you... Assuming you're the director or the cinematographer, so you're collecting shots and you are mentally making notes that these are A roll shots and B roll shots. Not at the time. Not or are you going necessarily out to shoot A A roll shots? You know, and I'm gonna on this afternoon, I'm gonna go and get a bunch of B roll shots. That's a that's a great question, mm -hmm. but yeah, when you're talking about A roll, like I'll give you a for instance, if I were doing a show about Hmong soccer league, right? right. Your A roll would be an interview with your husband and other players, oh, okay. right? That's right. the A roll, an interview. B roll might be a game you go to, and you, the only purpose you're going there for is for nat sound, which is natural sound, like the the kicking of a ball, someone yelling out, you know, cheering. players cheering. That's yeah. right. And and then video of that to accompany it, and you use that to cover up the interview of of your husband and other players. Right. You're so, highlighting right. more than so what he's doing. You're purposely going out to collect and then you're separating them, right? So you can later edit them better in a more organized manner necessary. Yeah. Generally, yeah. yeah. Generally, yeah. I mean, it, 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 I've done a lot of different types of shoots, it's, and I, I'll, I'll talk, well, I might as well talk about it now. I was going to talk about it in a little bit, but um, basically when, when I do an interview, what I usually strive for is I do the interview first, 
and then I take mental notes as I'm listening to what they're saying um, uh, and if they're talking about specific things I'll try to then go get b-roll specifically of what they're saying so that I can overlay those shots as they're talking about it um, and then when I go to edit before I actually start editing I organize my files on the computer and I have like an interview folder and then b-roll folder um, so that I separate my clips I've done shoots before where it's a little bit more chaotic and I have to get some b-roll shots first and I have b-roll on multiple cameras and then I do the interview and then I do some more b-roll and then other interview so when I go to load the clips into the computer they're all like out of order and then I have to basically just watch through them and figure out which is which and sort them into folders at that point so and, and there's really I mean a-roll and b-roll those are just again that was an easy way to define you know different ways to categorize shots but when it comes down to it, and you're in the editing booth, something that was B-roll could easily turn into A-roll. Mm -hmm. I'll give you, for instance, if somebody yells something really cool about your subject, like, way to go, and whatever your husband's name, you may want to open with that, you know, in the, at the start, and that suddenly becomes your A-roll sound, mm -hmm. or, or NAT sound. It's the primary noise you'll hear, right? It's not some music underlay or, or anything in the background. It's what they hear right away, right? So that's a for instance of how you can switch between the two. But, oh. yeah. So let's jump back into shooting. We kind of oh. jumped into the editing <laughs> there. Each new shot should involve a change in both image size and camera angle. If you can do that, it already makes your sequencing more interesting. Because what you'll see is from a wide shot, you may get a close up and a medium shot, but it's all from the same angle, right? but at least it's differing compositions. So you can mix in. If, if you started an interview with just establishing what the subject is, but then suddenly your, your person you're interviewing becomes more emotional and they tell a personal story that's really heartfelt, then you get a close-up shot while they're doing that because it's more intimate and you know it makes people connect a little more. Um, this is an example of that. So take a, a look here. You get a wide shot of these two characters talking. You get your medium shot of the gentleman over here from a different angle. So look how it slides up. And then you get a close-up of his face. So while you're sequencing this, you could mix and match these shots in any different way you want. But maybe you start off with the cutaway. You know, the kid walks up. And then you go to a wide shot to show where they're standing. And then you jump to a close-up of this guy talking and then back to a cutaway, and then to a medium shot. Mm -hmm. Or in any other order. It depends on what the flow of the, the content is. Mm -hmm. But that's that's why it, it would make it a lot more interesting. I don't know, Ben, do you want to? Yeah. I, all I was going <laughs> to say is uh, the, the order of the sequencing, um, that's, that's entirely up to your artistic vision. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, no video, you could, you could have the exact same footage, like we, Dietrich and I could go out and shoot a variety of footage and give it to all of you and mm -hmm. say, put together a story out of this and every single video is going to be different because mm -hmm. that comes down to your own artistic vision. So there's no like hard and fast rule of like you need to, s to start with a wide shot and then go to a medium shot and then a close up. I was really confused about that when I first started in this in college. I, I, I thought, that when I was learning this, I thought that you had to start with a wide shot, then a medium, then a close up, and you keep sequencing in that order, and my videos were horrible, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> so when it comes to the order of the shots, that's, just, that's completely up to how you want the video to flow, um, and how you want to tell that story. You see, the way you all have got me starting to think about this, I just simplify things, that's how I try to look at it. First off, you, t you want to tell a story. You gotta have your beginning. And then the stuff to support what your story is about behind it in different angles, from the small to the large. But you want things that where persons are, one or two persons, want to express themselves a close-up. And if it's something where they're walking away, you show their distance as they're going. And then no matter what you're telling that story, you got to have that ending. And that ending's got to be something to put on their minds where they don't forget that story. That's how I look at what you're saying. That's a, that's a great way to think of it, actually, is um, you leave, you know, like any other story, you want to leave uh, your viewer thinking about it, a call to action almost. It's like giving a good speech, too, if you ever study speech writing. It's the same kind of idea, where you want to make uh, what you're talking about <coughs> memorable. Right? Yes, yeah, I do. Sticking your head. Okay, so we're back to this 
wide shot, close up, medium shot. Notice how all of, they've moved locations, right? They just didn't stay here and zoom in on his hand. They couldn't have gotten that angle, right? So what they, what they have, and the reason you'll see at a baseball game, uh, I'm not sure how many cameras they have, but usually one on every side of the field and at different elevations and angles, right? So they'll go from camera guy A to camera guy B to camera person C, right? And it switches it up. But when we're talking about a studio, you can easily move these cameras around to get that same kind of effect. And if you're wondering, well, hey, I met, uh, how did they do that in film? Well, guess what? They shoot multiple takes, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's pretty common knowledge, right? They'll do a scene six or seven times, but they'll shoot it from different angles and you know, different deliveries so that the editor in post has different options to play with. So that's how they do that. But if we're talking like a live event, like a soccer game, well, <laughs> that's kind of tough. But you have to... Yeah, kind of think outside the box on that one. Uh, Jeff? Just yeah. for a, a good points off, for our little modest show, we do move the cameras around um, just to add interest. So Democratic Visions, which is um, basically a studio show, uh, it looks like it has six cameras. Wow. <laughs> because halfway through the interview, I'll move the cameras around and give it a different angle. And, and it adds in visual interest. Now, people aren't thinking about this consciously when they're looking. If they, I don't know who watches our show. But <laughs> anyway, it does kind of work, and it helps. And sometimes what, I, what we do is if our guest is fumbling or our host rambles on like he tends to do sometimes, um, I redo a, I, I politely ask, hey, could you say that a little bit better? And I'll change the cameras around a little bit. And I'm recording additional stuff. They're talking about the same uh, subject, but I have more to edit from here. You know? mm -hmm. And that, that really helps. And, and one of the, well, that's, I just wanted to add that because we found it very helpful for our show. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll just make a note on that. Jeff does his show quite a bit differently than a lot of other studio shows, which is great he's you know he's thinking outside the box but he records his interviews in chunks um, in like smaller chunks he doesn't do a straight half an hour long yeah. interview um, and just you know switches between the cameras that entire time because so. our guests are mediocre so so Jeff's, no. Jeff's show does take quite, quite a bit more um, effort in the post he does a lot of editing yeah, with his show yeah. so okay. um, so just keep that in mind you know if you do want to think of a way to, to um, change up how you do your show um, you know it's uh, Editing does take time, but it's worth it in the end. Um, you know. So we'd have to learn editing, huh? Well, and that's yeah. part of this whole deal, right? And, <laughs> and I just <laughs> add that, so uh, we're doing our studio show as if it were kind of a documentary, oh, mm -hmm. in a sense, okay, because we, we edit heavily. And the reason I do that is uh, because I want our guests to come off as bright and comfortable and good looking Amen. as they would be uh, sitting in our kitchen talking about the same stuff. Your show is very reminiscent of a lot of PBS shows. I'm just saying. You know, I, I have a history with some of those. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, I did want to just mention this. Really, it comes down to you have two options. You can either buy more cameras or you can shoot multiple takes, right? Yeah. So if if, for instance, um, I was talking with Patty earlier about her show and doing sh uh, field shoots versus our studio shoots here, right? You have three nice cameras here and it's pretty simple to do a two-person interview, right? But in the field, it becomes a little more tricky because you don't have this established and maybe you only get two cameras, right? So one idea I suggested to her that maybe some of you could benefit from is you can buy a GoPro and use it as your wide shot, right? And then use your two other cameras that have zoom capabilities to get your close-ups, get your medium shots. And that way, you aren't wasting it on a wide shot. But the point being is that if you have multiple or more than one camera, um, I'm sure all of you have seen the clapboards in Hollywood, right? Yeah. The reason they do that is, and I, Brent, I know you know this, syncing sound, right? That's the idea. In uh, Premiere Pro, you can do something called multi-sync editing. 
And what it is is you're putting multiple video clips on the different layers. And all you're doing, it makes it so easy, you're syncing it all by that clap. At the very start, you leave it rolling. And then all you do is cut back and forth in post, right? You chop out here, chop out there. And it looks seamless because you don't, you know, you're not spending so much time going back and forth and trying to make it all perfect. It's already synced. So that's an advanced technique, but anyway, we don't have to jump too far into that. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so let's jump right into the sequencing. So this is part of the editing process. We've talked about this close-up, medium, wide shot. Like Ben said, there's a variety of ways you could set this up depending on your subject and depending on how you want to build drama or you know interest in, in what you're doing. Maybe you start off with that close-up and everybody recognizes that baseball and he's rolling that baseball in his fingers. And then you cut to, instead of this guy, you cut to the batter's face and he's sweating, you know, he's trying to get ready for that ball to come. Then you cut back to the medium of shot, slow motion, this guy's whipping it, cut back to the batter, right? He's, yeah, I'm going to get you. And then, you know, so you're, you're telling a story though, right? It's very, it, it, yeah, that's storytelling right there. Ben, you want to anything on that note? You know okay. more about this concept. Okay, right? <laughs> all right. So this is this is one that I learned in, in video production class, and I, I think it works uh, well. So what they're referring to, a clean entrance, clean exit. You're looking at a person turning a dial, right? So the exit is clean. The hand is there. They turn the dial. They pull back out. The problem is right here, you have nothing to match over this cut. So this guy, his hands is, are in his pocket. Well, if you cut too early and don't have this part with the hand coming out, it'll look like a jump cut, it's called, where there's no continuity to his action, if that makes sense, right? So otherwise, you get this thing where it's the hand, and then suddenly his hands are in his pocket. And you're like, how, how did, what, what happened to his hand? How did he get there so fast? So that's the idea. Now with this, this idea is a, a little bit smoother. So you go from a person going into their home. Mm -hmm. Do you have to get shots of them going up the stairs, going down a hallway, doing all that? Or can you just directly go to the door of the room you want them in and they'll open the door? And to a viewer, it makes sense, right? Because you saw them go into their house, but you don't need all the little details. It goes back to that, tell me a story. Right? Mm -hmm. Jeff didn't have to tell me at 8 a.m. he did this, 9 a.m. he did this. He said, I did errands. It's the same concept. Okay. Any questions on that? The problem with that is the sequence doesn't match. The door handle's <laughs> on the wrong side on two and three and four. Oh, you got him. And you don't, oh, have, you don't, have, and you don't <laughs> have windows on both sides of the door. Ah, you <laughs> oh, you're right. Sorry. Oh. Hickey, well, hickey, hickey, hickey. Hickey. Yeah. That's good, though. Continuity. And I, yeah. Well, and I think, yeah. I think, that's right. I think with this, yeah, I think with this specific out. example, this is supposed to be like a bedroom. And yes. that's, so, you're, so you realize... It's pretty obvious that it's like a bedroom he's walking into, not like the living room or the front right. entrance. No, I no. think I think that's the general <laughs> make concept. Make yourself feel better. Uh, <laughs> I didn't I didn't make this. I'm just <laughs> that's true. I'm just trying to defend it. I, guess. I don't know why. But I, well, that's I, a jump kick because you're going from uh, outdoor to an in, into a uh, room that he didn't pass through. That's right. right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So um, we're gonna that. So that's that concept of of making sure. Um, and I'll just leave it on this for a second, making sure that you've finished your shot, right? Giving it that 10 seconds. When, when our friend was referring to, why do I shoot between six to 10 seconds? Because what you're, you're banking on is the first two seconds may be shaky because you're still trying to get the shot right if you're touching your camera. The last two seconds, you may be adjusting to hit the record button so it stops recording. So it might be a little shaky then. So that way you're giving yourself a buffer of that middle chunk being the part you want in post-production. That's, that's one reason. Well, and and also by giving that too, you give you options as far as if you want to dissolve between scenes because yes. that'll give you a chance to, as soon as something goes and then dissolve, if you want a smooth transition to the next one, it's the overlap that you need so the, uh, you don't see the one camera pull away you know, while you're in the middle of the dissolve or something. All right, so we're going to watch. You used to call it heads and tails. Oh, yeah. I still do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
We're going to watch a trailer for Star Wars Rogue One, and we're going to talk about this concept of cutting on the action. I'm pretty sure you guys can guess what it means, but let's just think about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to pause right there. What was the action that they cut on? What did you notice was in that? The action is when that X-Wing hits the shield, right? Mm -hmm. What does it cut to? Let's watch that. Let's play that back really quick here. How many shots were in that like three second window there? Maybe four seconds. You saw the pilot's face screaming, right? You see the first hit, mm -hmm. then it switches not only angle, rotation, right? To show another shot of it. Then you get a cockpit view of the guy pulling off, right? So cutting on the action, that's a very key part of sequencing. Mm -hmm. So when we're referring to cutting on the action, that means if I'm shooting something as simple as picking up this paper off the ground, Right, I may stoop down with a medium shot, and as soon as my hands get here, maybe we get to a close up. Right, then I pull back out, and it's a medium shot again. Right, that's a very simple way of doing cutting on the action. This is obviously Hollywood, so they do a little bit more than that. But that's the idea: is when you make your cut in post production, you're cutting right as something interesting is about to happen to whatever the subject is, whatever you want to draw attention to, if that makes sense. I'm learning. I, I think, I think <laughs> if, did that example help? Ben, do you yeah. have one that maybe could benefit anyone? I don't really <laughs> have that? one that I can like explain. I yeah. Guess. Well, that's why like we do democratic visions. With plane crashes and <laughs> X-wing fights. Yeah. yeah, I didn't know that. That's, very, yeah, that's amazing. Okay. <laughs> no, but but your paper thing too, uh, picking up. It may be an important document, and so if you get a close up, make sure the people can see something printed on that document that helps tell your story. Mm -hmm. Precisely. You know, I like that. Precisely. And and uh, this is a totally different thing, but it's trying to create. Or let you know that these guys are in panic and, yeah. and think bad things are happening. But that may have been a secret document about uh, Southwest Community TV. That's right. And the plot to take over BCAT. That's so. right. <laughs> Don't tell Ben. Don't tell Ben that. <laughs> um, I guess kind of a, an example I'll try to explain it as best I can too is we don't really talk about audio much in this, but it, um, you can also sequence with audio essentially or cut on the action with audio as well so um, you know let's say um, uh, for example you're doing your your documentary about Hmong soccer you might have a little bite in an interview where um, you know maybe right at the end of that that sound bite they kind of pause and they're talking and as soon as they pause maybe you hear a sound of a soccer ball being kicked and then all of a sudden the second time you hear it kicked 
boom, it cuts to the, a shot of them, whoever it is, kicking the ball, you know, back and forth. So that's another way that you can that's use right. audio to help visually tell your story. Right. As you, you cut on the action when you hear that, that you know, that sound. And yeah, again, it doesn't... Of that. That's cool. Yeah, well, and again, he's, he's right. So when you're talking about how sound and video mix together, mm -hmm. What you hear doesn't always necessarily have to be what you see right away. Mm -hmm. There's real, there's a lot of strength in that, um, and like, yeah, I mean, if you, if you hear the sound of, let's just say, the whistle or somebody um, like a train coming, and it's mm -hmm. a slow buildup, but somebody's talking about something else, and you just want to hold it on them for a little bit, and then reveal as soon as the train whooshes by. That can be powerful, or you know, wow. again, Ben's example is perfect too. Yeah. I have a question. No. Yes, sir. Are there any basic guidelines, rules for how to use the zoom in any of these sequence cuts, especially in like a B-roll piece? Okay, because as you were discussing B-roll earlier, I was seeing in my mind's eye many shots where the B-roll is a zoomed, in, you know, a zooming in or out image of a building or a grounds. Did, does one wait for the zoom to end before they transition out of it? Is is, is there any rules like that in dealing with that? Zoom <laughs> should last a period of time? Again, I don't know if there's any hard and fast rule about that. Um, for the most part, uh, I. I don't think people usually show the zoom a lot of the time um, unless you specifically are using the zoom to help you know tell your story in a specific way so um, uh, I can't think specifically of, of any movies that do this but uh, um, you know there there might be a shot where um, suddenly somebody's expression goes like <gasps> or something like that and it does this what's called a rocket zoom in on them and then the music's like -na -na, you know or whatever. Yeah. At the same time. Yeah. Um, you know that might be where you use like a zoom um, or possibly you know you might have a really really slow zoom um, you start with like a wide shot of like a city and you do like this really really slow zoom into like the downtown area or something like that yeah um, news, story, news story talks about this building okay and mm -hmm. then the, 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 the shot is this building is there like if zooms can probably get boring I mean a shot sequence is a pretty fast thing in but not in a documentary setting, probably, or an interview. There are no fast shots. Uh, you know, I, I uh, think it's a part, if I may interrupt. Yeah. Yeah. Jack, it's the call of the editor. If it feels bad, don't do it. Yeah. And if you have a real long, slow zoom, and I've done a lot of PBS stuff where long zooms are interminable, and our camera guys would occasionally say, no, I want to get a different speed. Even then, they were too slow. We would dissolve out of them okay. rather than break up the mood and then it felt better but it's going to be the call in the edit suite using your zooms and your pans and your swings mm -hmm. and if it's a rock and roller type thing to have fun with it you know if it feels bad in a serious documentary it might feel really great in a rock video or a polka video you know? mm -hmm. well and we used to use zooms all the time as far as i'm concerned live shooting zooms live is a lost art there's very few cameramen that know what they're doing, yeah. that mm -hmm. uh, understand it. We uh, Nowadays we do it, like you said, mechanically in, in the post suite with the uh, high HD cameras you can do it. Uh, we used to use zooms to move out of the se sequence. When I used to shoot live music videos, I used to, if I wanted to transition off of a shot, i say, okay, I said, I'd tell my cameraman to zoom to black. So he'd zoom over the shoulder of the artist yeah. into the black thing, and then I, at the same time I'd be dissolving off another camera into another shot. Mm -hmm. And and then there's uh, the the offset shots if you have multiple cameras. So mm -hmm. it just kind of depends on what you want to do. Yeah, uh, it's now con you can control a lot better in the in the post now than you used to. Yeah, I, I should I should reiterate that the zooms really aren't used too much in like like short films or feature films a whole lot. But in live stuff, I agree it's it is kind of a lost art. And I used to. Um, do some work for the station out in Stillwater Valley Access Channels and a lot of the stuff that they do are events, especially concerts. And when I would direct a concert, I would do that as much as I could. I would say, okay, 
you know, camera, a lot of times it was like camera two, the wide shot in the middle, I'd say, give me a nice slow zoom. And, and then they would start zooming and I would dissolve to them. And then I would dissolve back to like a close up of a, you know, a certain person or whatever playing an instrument before they were done with their zoom. Um, so, I mean, you can use zooms. I think they make sense a lot more for live things. And I do still see it fairly often in the news. A lot of times if they go out to a reporter, um, let's say, you know, there's a house fire or something, there's a reporter on the scene and they start off with the reporter talking and then they'll say, if you look over my shoulder and then maybe the cameraman will zoom in, um, you know, whatever's happening in the scene. And then before they're done talking, they zoom back out to the reporter again. And a good cameraman, those, <clears throat> when we used to do it live, they had to have a, a double focus set up on the camera. You had to have your, your shot on your person and your far shot, so you had to have uh, an adjustment sometimes between. Uh, the, the best part to using zooms as far as my advice is if you have a shot that you have to be on a long time, mm -hmm. give it a little bit of movement, either push in or push out just a little bit, mm -hmm. just to give it something to make it more interesting okay. to keep up on it. You know, just don't stay on that static shot, okay. like I said, over three to four seconds without even just a little movement. Well, like in the, you were saying the story about a building downtown or uh, type thing, you might start on your establishing shot and then just slowly zoom in to either the sign or or even just a tighter shot of the building. So, what I, what I like are the uh, Toho films from Japan in the fifties <laughs> and sixties with Godzilla. Lots of yes. zoom shots. Yes. <laughs> Lots and Starsky and Hutch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know. Talk uh, about Godzilla, that's all action, reaction, <laughs> quick zoom in, oh, you know, like zooming yeah. in, zooming yeah. out, you know. And they're uh, even better in poorly dubbed English. Oh, it's but yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> well, so my comment on the zoom thing is zooms work really well, and again, you have to feel the energy of your video type, right? I think that's the message that I'd, I'd probably get across is if it's a high action rock concert, zoom all you want. Just go crazy with the zoom because it's fun, it's high energy, you're supposed to be moving around. The zooms can also create chaos in general. If you're moving your camera all over and you're trying to get that like realistic, like, oh, you're in the moment kind of thing, that's when it, it can work really well. Uh, on the other side, with slow zooms, um, like Brent was saying, from a wide shot, it works really well just to create a little bit of motion. But what I'm going to suggest is if you're doing something very dramatic, and you know I mentioned uh, doing an interview with somebody, and when you notice that they start to tear up, or they start to choke up, or get emotional, that's when you get the slow zoom, and you just go really slow, but you're, what you're doing is you're building that intimacy for when they deliver their line yep. that really hits you, right? And you can feel that because if you're doing it right, you'll feel it as you get to that point where they say what needs to be said and a tear comes out, you're yeah. right up tight, you know, <laughs> oh. Um, so that's, that's my advice on zooming at least is it, use it, but don't go too crazy if it doesn't match the feel of what you're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. If your video is like about the peace of nature and suddenly you're like zooming in and out <laughs> and you have super calm music, that would throw me off as a viewer, yeah. right? So I, again, it just, it depends. You can feel for it though, definitely. Oh, one, oh. one comment sure. on Zooms too. If we're all using a lot of friends who aren't professionals who use cameras and all that, yeah, and they're really helpful. And I always have to tell them, no, you stay on the wide angle because they're gonna wanna zoom in on stuff. <laughs> oh, she can look cute. Oh, isn't she cute? You know, and the camera's <laughs> dancing all over the place, and you can't use any of it. And that happened with a, a, a dear friend of mine who went over to Kenya to visit relatives from Somalia. And, you know, we went over this stuff, but when they got over there, oh, there's, you know, and it was some, 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 couldn't use any of it. Right. What I ended up doing was freeze framing a lot of things. <laughs> so at least I had good stills to use. <laughs> Well, and, and that's it. So uh, another way uh, you can use zooms uh, is with still photos. So if you have a, a professional photographer, I do this with weddings a lot, is I'll get video and I'll stay wide or medium, right? And I'll let the photographer who's taking the stills do a lot more of the close-up shooting. And I'll combine the video with the photos and add slow zooms and post uh, to the faces of the bride or the mom and, you know, the groom, all that sort of stuff. Um, and that's, again, depending on what the feeling you're trying to get across is, uh, it can be really effective, the combination of that media. Um, so yeah, that, anyway, my two cents on that. Okay.
So this is another sequence. It's called the close-up collage. And what I love about this is that it can be used for pretty much anything. I, our friend before talked about eggs being made, right? Mm -hmm. This is coffee being made. So uh, this I'm going to send out to you guys, but watch, watch the sequence. Ooh. Makes me want some coffee. I know, I want some coffee. <laughs> I don't drink it, but one's like a blue moon. Seven and up. again, so let's watch it one more time. So you see how it's going through all the steps, but they're all close-ups, mm -hmm. right? They're not spending a lot of time showing how slow everything is. It's really quick, like push the button. Oh, filling up for three seconds. Oh, cut to this. And turn off because coffee's done. Right? No, no wide shot of Richfield. No, no wide shot. Yeah, yeah. I would say with the with the close-ups though too, they also can be overkill. With like a yes. short with a short video like this, you know that that's fine. I mean, this looks almost like a commercial um, trying to sell this coffee, and and it and it works. <laughs> it works. But if you have a longer video, um, you know, if you don't vary up the shots every now and then, you know, like like Dietrich said before, you know, maybe like three close-ups in a row, three or four close-ups in a row is fine. But if you have two minutes of like all close-ups and then all of a sudden you go to another like establishing shot it's gonna be really confusing so I, I would say don't go too crazy with the close-ups <laughs> well and so one example of this is when a character and especially in comedies they do something like hey we got to get from point A to point B right they'll switch to a close-up of car opening door shutting right Zzz, open door you know get out the car and you're there Right, and it's it can all be done in a really close-up fashion. You don't have to spend the time saying da 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 do traffic or whatever. It bore you to death. So, um, yeah, that's that's one option for sequencing. Okay, so the reveal. This is another thing that I find it's it's useful for revealing something that's behind somebody. I think the show Survivor does it often where it'll start on Jeff Probst, who's the host, right? And uh, I think that's his name. Anyway, it's, it's like really tight. And he'll say, on this season of blah, 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 40 people battle it out for, you know, the ultimate prize. Zoom out. And it reveals all the contestants behind him on this island, wherever they are. It's some fabulous location that I want to go to. Um, so let's check it out. Oh. Mm -hmm. So it should be down. Sorry. Get down to it. Um, no. Nope. So check it out. Yeah. Yeah, we're just going to go through this. Right. So you notice you can't tell where she's at when you're close up, but then it reveals that they're out in the field somewhere. Right? Not too elaborate. But again, that's just a really simple sequence, see, sequence idea of revealing. Okay. We're gonna go to action reaction. I know you guys all know this one, so let's just go down to it. Um, <laughs> so obviously, establishes with a medium shot. She bites the apple. She's gonna offer it to a friend. Ew, it's gross. No, oh, fine with me, bro. I'm gonna eat it anyway. <laughs> Perfect. So again, that's pretty simple, but again, all these simple sequences become more complex when you combine a bunch of them together, right? So if you take that Rogue One trailer, for instance, you'll see a, a dozen of these kind of reveals or changes in sequencing. Okay, so <clears throat> we're to the editing part, even though we've covered a lot of it. What it really comes down to is time manipulation, right? Sequencing is manipulating time unless you're doing something like a baseball game or, or some live event. Right? And what we mean by this is you can either speed up shots, right? We've all seen time lapse shots where something that probably took a week to do is suddenly sped up to uh, 30 seconds, right? The construction of a building, for instance. So let's think about this. How do you describe time? How would you describe time? Give me some words. How do you describe time? See know? Okay, I'll start. Days. Weeks. Minutes. Minutes. 
Seconds. Seconds. Pondering. Right. So Lump. all of these are ideas, though, of, of the concept of time, right? How it, how it works uh, together. So if I tell you a week, a week is made up of how many days? Seven. Okay. And how many hours go into a day? 24. Right. So the concept of changing time, turning what is seven days into 30 seconds, right? Turning 10 months into 10 seconds, right? This idea that time, it flows in a linear fashion, but you can speed it up and slow it down, depending on what your, your video's purpose is, wow. right? Sequencing is this art of controlling time and space for a viewer, is, and that's what it really comes down to. You're, you're giving the viewer the idea of how to feel in a certain moment, and I'm gonna use that Rogue One example, in that moment, it feels like you're with those pilots, right? Mm -hmm. Flying in, trying to get there before the force field comes. But again, it's controlling that time. You feel like you're in there. But in the beginning of that trailer, if you remember, they're jumping all over the place yes. of people climbing up a ladder to get into a ship, of going to this other lady who's running down a hallway, of going here. It, time's all over the place, but they're generally you, know, you understand as a viewer, they're getting ready for a battle. They're getting ready to go somewhere. Versus the real time of the ship, right, coming into there. This is this concept of time. So a real time example, baseball, right? Uh, we already talked this one to death. But as you go through here, it's that wide shot to throwing it. All of this establishes that it's happening here and now in a linear fashion, okay? Now, I chose this video because this is not only do I love the Vikings, but, sorry, Packer fans here, but it's a really cool it's video, and, and it, looks ah, it shows you the idea of time-lapse of them building this. So, the old Metrodome. Right there, it's the Metro Bowl. Metro Bowl. Edited that and then did a zoom on it afterward. To give it some movement. Pretty cool, but look at that timing. Yep. A minute and 33 seconds. You know how long that process took in real time, yes. right? In months, months and months. Yes. And and that technique, if you're wondering what that is, it's time lapse. Um, there's many ways to do it, but essentially what it is is they took a photo every so often, right? With the change, maybe it's one photo a day even for a project this big. But as you put those together in a string, you can turn it into what's known as an image sequence. And what that is, is you turn all those photos you've taken, maybe thousands of them, and you turn it into a single video. And in post-production, you can do what Brent was talking about, is add that little slow zoom in to your now video. But all it is is a bunch of pictures that they took over a very long period of time. Multiple cameras. Ben, you want to answer this? Yeah, I was, I, I was just going to say, too, you can do time lapse with the video as well, mm -hmm. because yeah. basically, all video is is it's a series of photos. So when you're shooting something in 30 frames per second, it's essentially 30 photos mm -hmm. in one second is what it's doing. It's just the video camera is taking all of those pictures like rapidly and right. compiling them together for you. So um, you know, and if you think of like old old movie film, you know, they, if you it's actually look at the film, there's you see all those individual frames in there, and then they just speed it up on the reel. 
to put it all together to make it a video. So it's uh, that's well. basically all video is is just a series of tons of images. Yeah, exactly. Well, and the the best tool that I, I taught a few kids with this one is flipbooks. Everybody remembers mm -hmm. flipbook. <laughs> that's essentially what video is. It's a flipbook, but instead of just having like sixty pages, we're talking thousands of pages, right, of individual frames like Ben's talking about. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, um, let's get back here really quick. Okay. So, another one is more of a narrative time manipulation. And I just want to cry give you this Cry, little one, baby right? bunny, cry. cry. <laughs> you don't quit, do you? I want you to remember this moment the next time you think you will ever be anything more than just a stupid carrot farming dumb buddy. Well, he was right about one thing. I don't know when to quit. I've never seen this. Break your eyes, Paul! Good day, Paul girl! Enormous criminal! Okay, so the time manipulation in this example is the training montage, right? Yeah. The training montage is used in almost every movie out there, right? Where a character who's trying to develop into a hero has to go through the struggle and the pain of being a newbie, and suddenly by the end, they're like suddenly beating everything, and they're great, and they're powerful. That is an example of time manipulation, though. You don't have to see them go through every challenge, but you get the concept that, oh yeah, they weren't so cool at first, but suddenly they're really awesome now after you know, sticking with it, or whatever moral message you want to throw in there. Um, so yeah, so that's, a, again, another example of that time manipulation. All right, so I guess we're at this point where I don't have anything else to yeah. throw out there, um, but do you have any questions as far as... I yeah, some questions, about so, okay, so... Okay, so I'm very new to all this producing all that. So, what do you do with permission or cons consent forms? You know, especially if I'm going to a soccer game, mm -hmm. I want to get like close ups of. Do I have to like start thinking about things like that? Well, um, <laughs> in public. It's you know, yeah. It. I mean, it doesn't hurt. Um, it, when you're in a, a a public place like that, and there's a lot of people there, and there's yeah. you know more than likely you're going to be getting a ton of people on on camera. You can't go up to every single person and say, "Hey, sign this for right. me." Hey, sign this for me. Hey, sign this for oh. me. So that's why, like, I put up signs here saying that they were going to be recording this event. Mm -hmm. um, that essentially should cover you legally if anybody has an issue because. Uh, if you put up signs and people read it and they don't want to be on camera, they can move so that they're not going to be on camera. Um, if they don't read the signs, they just ignore them and they end up getting on camera and they get upset about it, you can say, well, I, you know, I put up signs. But in a public space, you should be allowed to record, um, you know, record video of people. Um, now with like the interviews, um, it's not a bad idea to have a, a, a consent form. Um, it's called a model release form um, of the, each person that you interview or someone that's the main focus of that specific shot. Um, just uh, again, in case you know someone you know comes back later on and says like after you're done with your video and it's aired on the channel and everything, they say, oh, I didn't want to be on TV or something like that. You could say, well, you know, you signed the form. Um, so the nice thing about the consent and release forms also is uh, if you do them, what what we used to do when we uh, used to do field uh, commercials and things like that, is we would take a clipboard and have all these consent and release forms on them. And as a person signed it, I would turn it over with a magic marker, put a number on it, have them hold up the number on a different shot so you know who that person is later. In case you, and, and if you have the right consent and release form, you can also have their name and their phone number. So you could send them a note saying, hey, I'm going to run this video on this on uh, Southwest 
uh, uh, you know, coming up now, and if you'd like to see it, this is when it'll be on. Hmm. That's a good point. Also, too, you get the correct spelling of their name. Yep. Yes. And if you want to use it for a super or anything yeah. like that. So. The, uh, also, uh, you know, we always, I've done, like you've done quite a bit of this stuff, and, and sometimes you do forget the forms, and so just on the video camera, I should, please say your name and you understand you're going to be on TV on this show. Yeah, and you could do that too. Yeah. 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 Just, but rarely do you run into any problems. Yeah. And no, if someone doesn't want to be on camera, don't. fine. Yeah. Yeah. You, know. you might want to get permission from the name of the, uh, in the case of the, uh, uh, the, the soccer, team? the soccer Are league. Just oh, okay. get, just say, you know, is it okay? I'm going to come. Mm -hmm. I'm going to come and do this. Yeah. And get that in either, either an email or something, so you have documentation mm -hmm. later that you got permission. Yeah. Or, or that, something like that's that. Exactly and what specifically I'm say, yeah. you know, reach out to the coach or whoever, mm -hmm. and specifically say, can you ask your players if this is okay, right. um, so that they, you know, you know that they actually went and talked to all of their players, and and the players are all okay with being on camera. Right. And like most organizations, well, larger organizations like school districts, for instance, they have a policy on video or photography of students, for instance. I'm sure the league that, you know, the Hmong League of Soccer has something, or if not, something to consider then, right? Yeah. So then. Yeah, schools are really sensitive these days. Oh, yeah. Yeah, really, absolutely. very, very sensitive. Um, Which is that, just especially yeah. if you're an old guy like me. Uh, that looks like he knows how he's handling the camera, but they don't check out all the hundreds of cell phone cameras no. <laughs> well, at the same time. That's know? what makes it so complex. Is yeah. when, uh, and we this is a totally separate topic for a different time. But, but yeah, if if something were to be caught on camera, you know, a crime or something, yeah. mm -hmm. um, it's the same kind of thing. Well, where's the public <coughs> release, and how do I, you know, do this? A lot of events I already have on the back of the tickets releases. Mm -hmm. For you know, if they're going to film something, uh, concerts especially, and that yes. if you show up on something like that, uh, not all high school uh, tickets and things like that have that, but sometimes they might. Mm -hmm. So it's not unusual to see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and like when I used to do stuff out in Stillwater, and they covered a lot of local concerts. A lot of the time, they were um, you know younger children. Um, like grade school children mm -hmm. and um, uh, basically we just put up a sign outside of the front door that said there's you know this concert is going to be recorded and we never ran into any issues in fact most most parents are excited that there's a camera crew there and they immediately come up to us and say hey how can I get a copy of that um, type of thing but um, you just you know you just never know it doesn't hurt to have illegally under 18 covered. in this state yeah. Yeah. It doesn't. They can't sign anything, mm -hmm. right? And and be binding. Mm -hmm. If if their parents object, you're in trouble. Yeah. 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 So it's better to talk to the parents and those in charge. Well, uh, a lot of uh, good good consent and release forms have the parent signature page mm -hmm. at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So and then one other thing to consider, I can say from photography, is that um, it depends whether it's commercial or non-commercial use. So if you're putting it on public access TV, it's non-commercial use. Mm -hmm. So you don't really need consent forms necessarily. But if you're going to be putting it in an advertisement, so for example, I, I took a picture of this model when I was first learning photography, had him sign a, a release. A few years later, I paid money to put that in a, a model, an um, uh, advertisement for photographers that went out to advertising agencies. And I get a call from this model's agent saying, look, you can't put that picture in there. This model's well known now, mm -hmm. and, and you can't use that image. I said, well, I've got a model release. I said, well, send it to me. So I did, and I said, oh, well. Okay, he shouldn't have signed it, but he did. So, <laughs> yeah. so you're okay. But there you go. You were protected, though, yep. right? Yeah. So you yeah. couldn't get sued. You can yeah. Right. It, Basically, the the bottom line is is if you're not sure about it, it's better to just do it and just cut. You know, make sure yeah. that you're covered. So exactly, yeah. safety precaution, yeah. and it protects you from any lawsuit <clears throat> sort of thing. Or, right, yeah. because the only way that without me researching more, the only way that I've been collecting footage is to not zoom in on people's faces. You know, like I'll do oh, like, interesting. I mean, that's not a good way, but I, I mean, I'm not afraid of getting sued or anything like that, but it's just like, you know, you just kind of like want to do it right. Yeah. Well, and, and I think all these are great right. examples of what you can do. You can talk with the organization. You can yeah. put up signs. You can do all three of these things. Mm -hmm. You know, send a talk with the coach and have them talk with the players and parents in the stands and say, hey, we're recording this. Um, if you end up in a video, 
we want to make sure you're okay with it, and if you're not, let keep us your, know. Keep your expletives down. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's the, yeah, that's exactly right. So, and it, kind of on the note of like not zooming in, um, the, the people who are on the camera, they have to be recognizable. So you can go out and you can shoot the back of people's heads all yeah. day long and they can't do anything about it because you can't specifically pick out that that's that person by the back of their head. It could you know, potentially be anybody. So, um, it's usually a side shot or yeah. a straight on. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. And they say if, if the mother can recognize them, you know, in a, in a total random video. Yeah. But the parents are going to have to prove that some damage was caused yeah. by your video, yeah. and that ain't going to happen. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's going to you know, well, but you don't want to deal with a nuisance suit anyway, yeah. you know, because it wastes your time yeah. and, yeah. and money. 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 <laughs> it's better to just cover your cover your basis if you're not. Okay, so I have version. another different question. So, if I do the public access to, how does it work with like? YouTubing, I me, mean, it's like oh. I own it, or what happened? You know yeah. what I mean? If, if let's say I go shoot a whole bunch of stuff over a year, and then I cut it into like I don't know a fifteen-minute documentary, yeah. but then I want to put it on YouTube, but then I want to. How does that all work? Well, I'm I'm pretty strict when it comes to this, and I'm I'm very adamant about this because it, it drives me nuts. Uh, if you use any public access equipment you need to broadcast it on our stations. Uh -huh. I mean, that's just hands down the rule. If you use our stuff, because again, it's paid for with public money, and it'd be unfair, for instance, if you used the public equipment, but only put it on YouTube, right? And oh, okay. didn't contribute to the station. That Is that editing on. plus camera? Or yeah, that's, I mean, any equipment, regardless. Yeah. So that's kind of the way I view it, and so that, I mean, it's written right in the policy. Okay. Yeah. Um, so as far as like the, the ownership of the content, you own, you own yes. the content. It's yeah. your video once it's oh. shot. Um, you can, you could shoot a whole bunch of stuff and throw it on your own external hard drive mm -hmm. and, you know, keep it for a rainy day or whatever. If it, if it's B-roll, you might want to go back to sometime, but you just, at some point, uh, um, you have to have content, you know, that you've produced that will go on the channel. Um, so, you know, we're, we're a little bit lenient about it when you're first starting out. You yeah. usually get like a few months to kind of get, you know, get established and, and get something put together. But then, you know, by that point, you need to have something ready to But it could be a different with. version. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, okay. yeah, I mean, it, it's, uh, like I said, we're, we're a little bit lenient on it. It's, that's, that's just the main thing is it has to result in some yeah. type of programming for our channel at some point. It can go on YouTube, um, you know. It, here we we're, we're okay with you putting it on YouTube essentially right away um, before it airs on the channel. I came from another station where um, it had to air on the channel first and um, the way that their master control worked out there is that they wouldn't start playing your show until three days after you submitted it because they had to have time to put it onto the channel and you know, schedule it and all mm -hmm. that stuff. So um, I know there was some contention with that out there because the producers would be like, well, I want to put it on YouTube right now so I can share it. But they, that was in our rules was you had to wait until it aired on our channel first. Um, here, we're not quite as strict about that. But mm -hmm. um, you know, if you go for six months um, using our, our facility and our equipment and I realize that you're putting stuff on YouTube and you haven't given me any, any stuff, you know, you're, you're going to be in trouble. So um, that's just kind of how it, how it works. Well, uh, one thing, I, I just think Access Television through Southwest Community TV and BCAT is a real gift. I mean, uh, to do the shows we're doing here, if we did them at Channel 2, um, which is a low-cost station to do things, it would cost about ten to 15000 maybe $20,000 mm -hmm. to do a half hour, okay? Wow. This is a gift. And everything we do here uh, in, when we are in Eden Prairie, we always credited um, our, our community access affiliation. We still do. I put our entire show on YouTube, and I put s s uh, individual segments, and always at the end, and sometimes at the beginning, I I say this is produced at BCAT uh, through the uh, 
or by arrangement through Southwest Community TV. And uh, you other producers here, I really hope you start doing that too. Right, that's a good Cause, thing. Because, you know, they don't, they don't owe us a thing. No. And it's don't. by the grace of people who subscribe to cable TV that we have this facility. Right. And it's extremely important that more people learn about uh, this stuff and where it's coming from. So. Yeah. So that's just kind of what, what we do, and I have a standard old thing. And, and when we, we try to get news coverage in our community newspapers for every new show we do, and every press release we put out also says the th same thing, and so it gets repeated. Now, who knows how many people read this stuff? I don't know, but it's, it's something. There. It's something, you know? Right. And, um, and these guys aren't requiring us to do that, but uh, you know, it is a gift. I mean, you know how expensive TV is. Sure. I mean, you know, we can't do this stuff if it weren't for but this I'm, facility. But, I mean, once I get further along, I mean, it's a lot of the policies are written out. Yeah. So yeah. I can read about it. Okay. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, this is all online, and I believe, you know, it's going to be in both VCAD and SWTV's policies. Yeah. Of, you know, in order to use this equipment that's paid through, uh, paid with using public monies, yeah. You, you gotta put it on our channels because right. sure. we're part of the public. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So. And, and like like Jeff said, like he splits his show up into segments too. Uh, you're more than welcome to do that. You don't mm -hmm. need to give us all of those segments. If you if you make a half hour long show mm -hmm. and you give us that half hour long show and then you go back and you cut up segments for YouTube, right. individual segments, that's fine. You can just put those on YouTube. We don't need every single thing that you create. It's just you have to consistently, you know, on a somewhat consistent yeah. basis, have to be giving us right, programming. Right, because I'm like a year into my project, but I'm not ready to like, put it out there yet, you know, mm -hmm. probably until earliest next summer. Yeah. So I'm just trying to figure out how to s organize everything. Yeah. yeah. Sure. I was going to say start off simple too. I mean, honestly, you could just broadcast your game. You yeah. don't have to do all the interviews. Those are really stuff. boring though. Hey, you know, <laughs> again, like cable access is the beauty of it. It's like, start what? small and then make yeah. it more complex as time goes by. But just get a feel for, right. you know, is Because I'm thinking I'm going to do a lot of like, you know, like warm up. You know, yeah, so you start sure. like players putting on the you sure. know, shoes and yep. <laughs> yeah. like for a whole year. It's like, well, what's happening? <laughs> is, is there going to be a movie? You know? Use time lapse. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. I was going to say, use the close up montage right there. I'm, I'm yeah. focusing on the old players, too. Yeah. Oh, so okay, sure. It's yeah. like, you know, when they were young, oh, now they're old. <laughs> yeah. That would be nice. Well, no, back in my day. I was going to say, yeah, back in my day. Right. A lot of, a lot of uh, shows do that, though. You know, uh, like The Simpsons, everyone yeah. and their mother knows the intro to The Simpsons, right? With, because it's consistent, but they'll make little tweaks here and there. But if you come up with that formula to introduce your show, it builds a kind of brand for you guys. So like, let's just say you wanted to do something different about a player each, a different player each time. Right. You could do a montage of those players' right. clips, but just sub in different clips yeah. in that intro. But if the foundation stays the same and like there's some catchy music that brings you in, then that becomes part of your show's identity, mm. right? So kind of hooks people in like, oh, I know what I'm watching now. Yeah, mm. I could show an example of that. Go oh, for more. sure, let's do it. Yeah. We don't get a break, my buddy's kicking my booty. Oh. <laughs> we're, 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 we're in the Q&A. <laughs> um, so let's see if I can find this quick. I have me sitting for a long time, I'm hurt. So public, so Bloomington Public Access is still on TV. It's, you don't have a YouTube channel? We do right here. Oh, okay. um, I just started this. Um, recently. I just started recently because there's, uh, I, since we're part of the city, we're a city um, you know, entity here. Um, they like, for instance, like the Facebook page is just for the city of Bloomington. They don't give mm -hmm. individual Facebook pages out to the different departments because oh. then every department would be like, we want our own Facebook page. So this was actually like, I had to kind of uh, talk my boss into this to let me get this um, because it, it makes more sense for us to have our own YouTube page yes. as opposed oh. to, you know, some of the other departments here since we are, you know, video production. You have eight um, subscribers. Facility. Yeah. Well, it's it's, I know that it's very new. <laughs> very, very new. <laughs> we'll talk about that. Okay. So, so a couple of did you, did you sign a release form? Yes, sir. <laughs> Show the bastard. No, I like the leaves. They're nice. So, so the example I was going to show.
um, is from like what Dietrich was saying with the introduction. Um, a couple of things that I started doing recently too are called producer spotlights, where I spotlight a different producer here. And Jeff, you're going to be coming up soon. Um, <laughs> uh, so the so so I've done two of them so far, and I kept the same type of intro. So like this is the one for the first video I did. I seen that one first. So that's the first one I did, and then with Lisa's, basically the same thing, same music, same transitions, just shots from her video. <laughs> um, so this is this is like what Dietrich was saying, like you just supplement different clips, but it's otherwise the same. Lisa has better fake intro. foliage in the background. Yeah. I'll quit it. You better leave my fake stuff alone, Daddy. You ain't bought me nothing new. <laughs> All right, guys. Yeah. got your ninth subscriber. So. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Refresh. Yes. Refresh. Try to. You got to start uh. somewhere. Um, oh, okay. So, Ben, do you want to talk about the challenge? Before yeah. We yeah. Let's. Here? We're gonna kind of try to wrap this up because it's getting a little bit late. But um, I'm sorry. We. No, it's fine. <laughs> um, so, so we wanted to throw out a challenge to everybody. Um, uh, anybody's welcome to participate in this, but if you are going to use our equipment to do it, you need to become a member if you're not already a member. But um, basically, we want to throw out this challenge for you to create a 30 second to one minute long promo video for either BCAT or Southwest TV. Um, you can choose, you know, between who you want to make it for, but if you're a Southwest TV producer, it kind of makes more sense to do one for them. Um, so just try to keep it even. Um, or if you want to do one for both, I mean that's yeah, the other one thing for too. Both. You could yeah. do one for each, and, and you know it's all good. Yep. I've never done um, anything like that. Who's gonna help me? <laughs> well, that's why it's a, it'd be a learning experience for you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, I'll do it. Um, so, so you have basically what three months or so to a little over three months, three and a half months to complete this. So a lot of time. What um, kind so of budget are we talking about? Ah, <laughs> 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 um, the budget of uh, a membership to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not really so, <laughs> so um, complete and submit these to me to BCAT um, by November 31st, and then our last producers club of the year, um, we're gonna choose winners and screen them. Well, we'll screen all of them, but then we'll choose winners. Um, so it's basically a week week before our last producers club. So if you want to partake in that challenge, please do. Um, be, yeah. I think it'd be a lot of fun. It's a fun challenge just to see if you can come up with something clever. I mean, you've all seen commercials probably you know most of your lives, so you kind of know what that feeling is like. What would get somebody interested in doing community access TV? Think about mm -hmm. it. You want? Back to sales. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah, and of course, guys, thank you for coming. Really, yes, like, really. <laughs> that's thank how we do it. For so, having us yep. here.